Hello everybody. So I'm creating a quick little loot bag. It's just a very basic model that I'm throwing together. But I figured that uh, I'd make sure you understood how I did it and then we'll program it so that uh, we can all uh, make use of it in our games. There we are. So there's the collider and we're going to give it a little bit of a physics object here. We're not going to let it rotate um, but we are going to let it use gravity and uh, that's going to be our loot sack. So let's go ahead and save that into our prefabs here. Now we're only using one kind of loot sack even though it might contain almost anything and the reason for that is that I like the idea of having uh, like swarms and swarms of these and they're all the same basic color uh, so it'll it'll have a better physical look to it if uh, if they're all the same color. But you know what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to tag this with some kind of loot script. So let's just go ahead and create a script for loot. And we'll fill it in later. Um, but for now, just having it exist is good enough. So there is our sack uh, of loot. Now if we hit play, obviously this sack of loot doesn't do anything, but it does exist. And we can bounce off of it and stuff. And we don't actually want our loot to... Um, to be a physics object in that sort of, of thing. Let's go ahead and make this uh, box collider into a trigger and we'll just see what that does to the loot. Ah, see it drops through the floor. So we're gonna have to be careful as to whether or not these are physical objects or not and we'll figure that out later. Um, because we're planning to absorb them into the player as the player gets close, it's not a huge issue. The player will never get close enough to run over one because they'll be flying at her. All right, well, the next step is to make them pop out of our slimes. Now, how do we do that? Well, over here in the slime, we have this uh, spawn treasure, but we never actually created any hooks for it, so it doesn't actually ever spawn anything. Let's go ahead and create ourselves a treasure spawner. And we'll just drop that onto our slime here. And uh, our treasure spawner is down here at the bottom. Of course, it's empty at the moment, and this is starting to get pretty pretty heavy with stuff. You can see that we've got a box glider kind of mixed into our scripts. Uh, you you can rearrange these, I think. Yeah, move up. That's pretty cluck, clun, clucky, clucky, clunky, but you can move them up like this. Move up, move up, move up. Ideally, it would just let you drag them, but that's fine. All right, so we've got our treasure script open here. And we are going to um, make it so that it cre can create treasure. So we're going to need to have public loot treasure. And uh, we're also going to need to actually have the ability to spawn it in. Public void spawn. And that will just be uh, loot L equals uh, loot instantiate treasure. Now we are allowed to specify a location and a rotation here, but we're going to um, oh well, well let's go ahead and specify them. Transform with a lowercase t dot position and uh, transform dot rotation. There it'll be directly on top of us, but uh, just for safety's sake, because this is a physics object, let's go ahead and um, uh, pop it out a little bit just so that when it gets caught inside of our collider it will shoot out upwards rather than some other direction and uh, we're gonna go ahead and set up our rigid body on that loot to have a velocity uh, that goes upwards so vector 3 dot up times 5 and then we'll just add in an, a random direction which we can do by vector 3 dot surface nope it's random dot on unit sphere. And this will just give us a vector 3 that is somewhere on the outside of the sphere. And that can be directly up or it can be kind of off to the right somewhere. And it's a great way of adding in random noise into your velocities. And that should uh, allow us to do everything we need to do. We go back over here into the slime and we hook up our spawn treasure by dragging it up and then clicking it spawn. There we go. Now if we want to, we save this with apply, and now all of the slimes should be set up correctly. Let's go kill a slime. By the way, it looks like I corrupted the tunic pattern at some point, um, so whatever, it's not that important. 
All right, ready to see what happens? Hmm, I forgot to at attach the prefab. Uh, it, it is trying to instantiate the loot, but as you can see here in the console, it doesn't actually have any idea what it's trying to instantiate. So we go into the prefab, and we drop the loot here. For some reason, this doesn't this didn't get saved. That's fine. Just add in a loot script there. And then go back up to the slime, drop the loot into the... Dunk, there we go. And now this can be saved. Let's try that again. Come back here. That is a really awkward run cycle. I'll fix it sometime. So here you can see that the loot has been fired. Now the loot is not all uh, intact. You can see that one of them fell through the ground. And we are also bouncing off of them. So there is a lot of optimization we're going to have to do with the loot. Uh, I'm not too worried about it because there's a lot of fun things you can do with that sort of stuff. But it is nice to see that it works so easily. And this only took us six and a half minutes. That's interesting. It, all, it looks like one of them always falls through. I wonder what's up with that. This one seems to be pinned under some loot. Bam. Yeah, look, there's always going to be one that falls through. What? I have no idea why that is. Um, but uh, it's very curious, and if you wanted to try and figure that out yourself, you can. Um, presumably, I will. Oh, see that? That's how all three happened. I don't don't really know what's going on there, but uh, optimization for the loot is required because right now they don't get absorbed or anything. Since we've only spent a little bit of time this episode, uh, let's go ahead and absorb them th in this episode. What we're going to do is we're going to make it so that when they get within a certain range of the player, that is bizarre how they fall through. When they get within a certain range of the player, they will uh, warp over to him. They'll turn themselves off. They'll turn their rigid bodies off and fly over. So to handle that, we need to open up loot here in our scripts loot. And uh, we're going to want to continually scan to see whether we're near the player. There's other ways to do this. We could use colliders or something. But... Uh, why not just do it this way? Uh, what we're what we're actually going to do is check for if we look over at where we are here. Uh, this is the character that we're looking at, but it is untagged, so we are not tagged as the player right now. So in order to make this work, we should probably tag ourselves as the player. And over here in loot, we're going to lock onto the player because that's slightly faster. Uh, we don't want to have to search through the entire thing for a tagged object every time. So then we just say um, uh, player equals get uh, find. It's find. Uh, game object find. There we are. For some reason, sometimes this doesn't take. But if you just uh, use this game object at find game object with tag player, that will always find the player as long as it, the player has been tagged. Uh, I think that capitalization matters, so might as well make sure to spell it correctly. It's capital P player. And I'm a little bit worried that we might have accidentally tagged other things with player, like that. So we'll go ahead and delete it. Um, and here we see that this has got a game object, but we're looking for a transform. So we just get the game object's transform. And now we have the player. And we can, over here, uh, let's go ahead and add another field in here. Public float. Um, magnet range equals hmm, 10. No, 10 is really wide. How about 4? And we say if player.position minus transform.position uh, dot magnitude magnitude is less than magnet range then we'll be magneting. So we want to add in another boolean here for whether or not we are currently uh, magneting in. I don't want to call it magneting. Let's call it homing. So here in update we say if we are not homing then check and see if we should be homing. You can tell we should be homing because we'll be near the player. 
So here, oh, we, and while we're homing, we actually want to turn our rigid body, uh, sorry, our collider off, and our rigid body for that matter. We want to turn all that stuff off. So rigid body dot is kinematic equals true. And I think we also have to turn off the gravity, but I can't remember. And we definitely want to turn off our collider, box collider. Uh, collider dot enabled equals false. Down here, we will just say that uh, transform dot position equals vector three dot lerp. Transform dot position, player dot position, and time dot delta time. And here we will say if we get within a certain range, uh, like say 0.7 then destroy us. And later on, in the next episode, we will change this into being collected by the player rather than being destroyed. So this just says, all right, home in if we're close enough, and if we're homing in, just lerp to the player. Very basic stuff. Let's go ahead and see how this looks. Bang. Oh, it was attacking. These slimes are so dangerous. Bang. So there's it lurping to us, but you can see that it lurps in towards our feet, which is not exactly what we would like to do. And it also, lurping might not be the right answer because they slow down as they get close, whereas what we would, might actually want it to do is um, fly towards us as it gets close you know, faster and faster rather than slower and slower. So not only is our position wrong, but we also want to change uh, the speed at which we are doing it. So vector three dot targ, vector three target equals player dot transform plus vector three dot up. And then down here, instead of setting our transform position equal to the player, we're going to just move towards the player. So vector three delta equals target minus transform dot position delta dot normalize and that will make sure that delta is always going to be the same um, volume. It's going to have the same magnitude regardless of how far away we are which means that our speed will always be the same. Now if we actually wanted to, to go faster and faster and faster we would have to do the opposite of normalize it. We would have to have like one divided by that or something similar. That's a, we're fine with it being a constant speed though in this case and we just say transform position plus equals delta times time dot delta time times two. And let's go ahead and take a look at this in action. Oh. I don't need to say player dot transform dot position because the player is a transform, see? So it's just player dot position. Come on, whack, wham, and wham. And that might be a little bit slow. We can increase the speed or do whatever we want. This one does not appear to be actually getting absorbed. They are just kind of hovering around inside of me. Ah, I know what the problem there is. First off, uh, we actually don't want to use player position here, we want to use target. We're attracting ourselves up towards the middle of the body, so uh, if we're testing against how far we are from the feet, we're never going to get very close. And the second thing uh, is we want this to be a lot faster, like this. Now we can use some kind of acceleration or something. We could just turn off the rigid body's gravity and use the rigid body again. There's a lot of options. Um, we can do it however we would like. That seems to be fine. And of course, the whole point of this is if we do hit a monster with a big blow like that and it goes flying off, we'll have to walk over there to collect it. But uh, it would be best if it didn't fall through the floor. I'm trying to figure out why it's doing that. Uh, it's kind of an odd bug, but I'll figure it out later. That's it for today.